The title of my talk today is Transforming Wastes into Resources in Haiti. And I know that when everyone hears Haiti, the first thing to jump to mind is the earthquake of last year. And I am going to speak about the earthquake. But before I get to that, I want to take us a little farther back in Haitian history and talk about how it is that a country that once produced two thirds of Europe's tropical produce in the late 1700s went from an incredibly rich agricultural country to a place where 67% of children are malnourished, to a country where today 54% of food is imported. Agricultural production has dropped 20% in the last decade. So these are some pretty shocking statistics. And in 15 minutes, I'm only going to be able to graze the surface. But I want to start out by talking about something that I always start my talks with, because I feel like it's very rarely mentioned. And it's a very important historical factor in understanding how it is that Haiti has come to be this way today. One of the things that you hear a lot about Haiti is about the tremendous environmental destruction. And this is absolutely true. And in fact, only 3.8% of Haiti's once very lush forests now remain intact. And when we talk about this, we often talk about deforestation due to charcoal production for cooking stoves. And this is absolutely one of the modern day factors contributing to deforestation. But something that is very rarely mentioned are the historical roots of this deforestation. This is a, a pretty famous photo, and it's often used when comparing Haiti to the Dominican Republic. And there's a lot of good reasons that are cited for this difference on the same island. But one of the reasons that's not cited, and that's very rarely discussed, is the fact that what you're seeing here are actually the environmental scars of extremely different post-colonial histories. In 1825, after Haiti won their independence from France, the French government forced the Haitian government to pay reparations on the order of $21.7 billion in today's currency. And that debt took Haiti over 100 years to pay off. And during that time, Haiti chopped down over 50% of their forests and that wood went to build Paris instead of Port-au-Prince. So when you hear these statistics about Haiti, I think it's very important to have this perspective because I feel like it's often framed in such a way that would make you think that Haitians have not been good stewards of their environment. And I think it's important to know this post-colonial history. So with that, I'm going to move us a little farther forward in time. This photo was taken in 2004 on my first trip to Haiti. And as an ecologist, as I was flying in, the very first thing that I noticed was this sort of brown lip that goes all the way around the edge of the country. And I said, OK, well, that's what's happening to Haiti's rich agricultural soil. It's running off into the sea because of deforestation. And Haiti's actually losing 36.6 .6 million metric tons of soil per year. And just to give you a comparison, in the UK, the erosion rate is about 2.2 million metric tons. So an extreme erosion rate. But as I spent more time in Haiti, I came to realize that this brown lip that you see around the edge of the country is not only soil. There's actually something else that's going into the ocean and turning it that color. And what that is is human waste. Haiti has by far the lowest sanitation coverage in the Western Hemisphere, and one of the lowest in the world. In rural areas, only 16% of the population have access to a toilet. And in urban areas, that percentage is only 35%. So the vast majority of Haitians do not have access to a toilet and are forced to go to the bathroom outside, in the bushes, in rivers and canals or in plastic bags, which are then thrown into abandoned lots or into the water. This is a pretty typical looking canal in Cité Soleil in Port-au-Prince. And what you can see here is, is that algal growth, which is actually caused by excessive nutrients from human waste that are going into the canals. Now, even in places where there is sanitation in place, it's often poorly designed or poorly placed. So you can see this latrine here, and then you see that it, it is built just over this river, 
where many people get their drinking and bathing water. So all of the human wastes that are going into this latrine are filtering down and into the water supply where it can then affect humans. This photo is another example. This is a very nice hospital in the central plateau in Haiti that I visited. And they had these great flush toilets. And so I said, well, what happens when you flush that water? And they took me out back and showed me this giant hole. And they said, it all runs off into this hole here. And you can see by the depth of this that at certain times of year when there's rain, the groundwater rises and mixes directly with that sewage. And this is the reason that waterborne illness is the leading cause of death in children under five in Haiti. And last year in October, Haiti had their first ever cholera outbreak, which has since claimed over 6,000 lives. So poor sanitation is really one of the leading causes of death in Haiti and something that's often overlooked. Haiti is a country with absolutely zero sewage treatment. And prior to the earthquake, there was not even a legal dumping site anywhere in the country for human waste. So when septic tanks or latrines were emptied, they're being emptied into rivers, onto the ground just outside of the city, in no sort of organized way. After the earthquake, when lots of organizations flooded into the country and began doing sanitation work, there was a lot of pressure on the government to identify a legal site for dumping. And this was the site just outside of Port-au-Prince, which was identified as a temporary site, but is still being used today a year and a half later. And this is the city dump where all of the solid waste from the city come. So the problem when you mix the waste streams like this is that you have a situation where people are coming to scavenge in the solid waste to find things to sell. And then they're being exposed to human pathogens, which were being dumped initially. They were dumping almost 40,000 gallons a day from 50 to 75 of these trucks would come. And initially, there were no holes or anything. So it was just being dumped onto the ground. And this photo was taken in April of 2010. There was a period of about two months where you actually could not access the dump because there were rivers of sewage running throughout it. In June of 2010, there was a, a slight improvement made. There were two giant pits dug at the end of the dump. And you can see those up in the upper right-hand corner of this satellite image. And this is better in that people who were scavenging were somewhat isolated from the human waste. However, if you look at this satellite image, you can see that those pits are only 600 meters from the Bay of Port-au-Prince. And you can see these sort of brown plumes going out towards the sea. And those are human waste, untreated, running off into the Bay of Port-au-Prince. As an ecologist, one of the first things that I thought about after seeing this brown lip around Haiti is, is there a way to recapture those nutrients that are running off into aquatic ecosystems and making people sick, damaging the environment, and get them back onto the land in a way that they can help to reestablish that agricultural vitality of Haiti? And one of the ways to do this is through the process of composting, which is what I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on. Our first two talks today talked about food, and, and I'm also going to talk about food, but I'm gonna talk about, instead of it going in, I'm gonna talk about it coming out the other end. So it's all part of the same cycle, and I will end up back with food. So what we do is we build ecological toilets in Haiti. My organization is called Soil, and it was founded in 2006. And we build a special kind of to toilet called a urine diversion toilet. So if you look at this seat, when you sit down on it, the pee goes one way, and then the poop falls down into a 15-gallon drum underneath the toilet. And each time you poop, instead of flushing with water, which is a very scarce resource, hard to come by in most places in Haiti, instead of flushing with water, you take a handful of some sort of dry organic material, and you use that to cover up the poop so that it doesn't smell and so that you don't get flies attracted to it. Now, this is one of our first toilets that we built in Haiti. And the way that it works is that the seat is elevated over a, a cement chamber there. And the urine is diverted back into this drum behind the toilet. And urine, I don't know if anyone's ever heard it called liquid gold before, but it, it actually is liquid gold. 
Urine has most of the nutrients in human waste, so all those things that we're eating that we just don't need, we pass right back out of our bodies. Those nutrients are mostly contained in urine. And urine does not have the pathogens that are in the poop. So if you can take that urine and dilute it with water, it can actually be used directly as a fertilizer and as a great free fertilizer source. We're all making it. The poop falls down into this chamber underneath the toilet. And when the chamber fills up, you actually move the toilet seat over to that second chamber. You seal the first one. And by the time the second one fills up, you can empty that first chamber, and it's already decomposed into something that doesn't look or smell like poop anymore. So in the first three years that our organization worked in Haiti, we built about 55 public toilets in communities that otherwise would have no access to sanitation. Then in January of 2010, there was the earthquake, which changed everyone's lives in Haiti and took the lives of over 200,000 people in the capital. I was living in Cap Haitian in northern Haiti at the time, and I had a group of students from the University of Miami with me. And two days later, they were able to be evacuated, and we took about half of our team from Cap Haitian. We packed a bag. We said, we're going to Port-au-Prince. We'll be back in three days. And I've actually been living in Port-au-Prince ever since, so for about a year and a half now. When we first got there, we really focused on just direct emergency relief, which was something that we had never done before. But it was amazing the way that everyone who had survived really banded together to, to help people who were suffering. And we distributed food, we distributed water, we did transport of, of victims. And then in March of 2010, we were approached by Oxfam Great Britain, and they said, do you think you could do a pilot project in the camps in Port-au-Prince with your toilets? And initially I said, no way. We don't, we don't do emergency work. We don't really work in urban areas like this. And I'm not convinced that this technology is going to be appropriate for a situation like this. Well, they were very persistent, and I'm glad that they were, because we finally agreed to try the project. And within six months, we put in 200 public toilets in 31 camps throughout the city, serving about 20,000 people. And if you look at this toilet, you can see we made some modifications to, for the emergency. We built them out of wood and tarps instead of cement so that when people began to move out of the camps, we can dismantle the toilets and, and take them out. You also see that this toilet is being used as a clothesline. And it's something I want to point out because one of the things that our, our team is most proud of is the fact that people in the camps where we have these toilets really say, these are the nicest, most comfortable, least smelly toilets that have been built in response to the earthquake. So in general, you would not see people hanging their clothes off of a latrine, because it usually you don't want to get anywhere near it. Uh, this is a picture of a camp committee. This was about a year after this toilet was built. And people still sit out on the steps all day. They do their homework there. It's actually a relatively nice place to hang out. <laughs> We also we made another modification that was really important, because in the camps, you have incredibly high usage. So instead of having these cement chambers underneath the toilet, we replaced that with a 15-gallon plastic drum. So each time the drum fills up with poop, you can just seal it, remove it, and put in another drum. And then we, we send the soil poop mobile around. So the poop mobile goes around once a week and collects these full drums and replaces them with empty drums and cover material. Now we take the drums out to our compost site where they're dumped and they're mixed with sugarcane bagasse, which is a byproduct of REM production. When the bin is filled, you cover it with a thick layer of organic material so flies can't access the compost. And basically, we leave it there. So it's a, it's a pretty low maintenance process. According to the WHO, to safely treat human waste, you need to achieve temperatures of over 120 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum of one week. So while the compost is in these bins, we take temperatures every few days. And you can see here, that one's at 160. We've had some of our piles actually reach almost 200 degrees, which is too hot. After we're sure the pathogens have been killed, we transport the waste out and put it in windrows like this. And it takes another four to five months before the composting process is complete. 
And at the end of that time, we get this incredibly rich, fertile soil, which generally I would travel with it, and I'd be passing it around right now for you to smell it. But I, I got a little nervous about customs this time, so I haven't come with a sample. <laughs> so I'm just going to finish up a really, a really quick example of what, where we're moving towards, is that we're now moving back into development work, and we're working on designing a household toilet model that could be indoor or outdoor, that basically looks like a box, so you wouldn't know it was a toilet. And when you lift it, you have the toilet seat, and underneath is a five-gallon bucket that's sealable. What we're looking to do is to rent these toilets for about one to three dollars US a month. People would pay this rental fee, and that'll cover the collection, transport, and treatment of the waste. And then compost sales can be used to subsidize toilets for families who can't afford them. So that's sort of a sneak preview of how waste can be transformed into a resource and can become a sustainable business. For now, I'll just leave you with the idea, what we're imagining is, is there a way to transform this practice that's making people sick, to take these nutrients and pathogens that are polluting aquatic systems, causing a public health problem, and to get them back onto the soil where they can be used for reforestation and agriculture to help solve some of these environmental and health problems. Thank you all so much. Before I go, I really want to acknowledge my incredible team that I work with in Haiti. It's an honor for me to be here, but certainly this work would never have happened without all of the support that I get. And I thank you all so much for coming, especially my parents who are here in the front row. Thank you very much.